So Christy, are you going to say something about the Zoom protocol? No? I'm gonna let you say that. Okay, Thank you. I'll, uh, all right. Then I'll go ahead and start and welcome everyone. Thank you very much for coming from all over the world for this first ever master's lecture series that the Society for Calligraphy has decided would be a great idea to share Donald with everyone. He's shared himself with the whole world for all these many years, and now we want to celebrate him yet again. I'm going to tell you why uh, the Society for Calligraphy decided to do that by sharing my screen and showing to you, um, gonna optimize that and um, talk about why we did this and what the Society for Calligraphy is all about and to talk about all of the societies all over the world really. So this Society for Calligraphy is presenting our 2021 master's lecture series with Donald Jackson. Sorry, I think someone is, uh, I can hear someone else talking. Um, so uh, the uh, lecture series is called Painting with Words. And from Royal Scrolls to the St. John's Bible to Have I Had My Breakfast Yet? Master calligrapher Donald Jackson shares lessons and insights from a lifetime of working in letters. Here are the four lectures that we've uh, designed that Donald has given these wonderful titles to. So our next lecture will be on um, September 4th. So we'll look forward to seeing you um, in two weeks. And um, the one that he will be uh, talking about today is about learning and luck, his early studies and training opportunities, inspiration and influences, traditional materials and techniques. This is what I particularly asked him to talk about uh, for the very first session. So I'm the moderator, Kitty Marriott. I'm a founder and former president of the SFC and an honorary life member. And the Zoom has been arranged by Christy Darwick, former president of SFC. And she has been uh, able to manage the 1400 people or so who have signed up to uh, view this fabulous presentation, uh, either live or uh, recorded. It's going to be recorded or is being recorded, I should say. So just to talk about uh, Donald's calligraphic pedigree, he sent me this picture some time ago. So Donald studied with Irene Wellington, who studied with Edward Johnston. So he comes from uh, royalty, really. <laughs> and so we're delighted that Donald Jackson is able to join us for this first master's lecture series for the Society for Calligraphy. Donald has long been the scribe to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, Crown Office at the House of Lords. And in 2016, he was awarded an extraordinary honor, Papal Knighthood, Knight of St. Gregory the Great at Westminster Cathedral on June 15, 2016. In 1974, the Society for Calligraphy presented Donald with the title Honorary Member, which we like to think is the most cherished honor he has ever received. So I'm gonna tell you about how the society was started and who were the main actors in uh, helping the society to get started. And Donald is here, of course, to tell us about his role in um, organizing so many societies all over the world. And he'll be particularly talking about that in lecture three, by the way. Maury Nimoy is our local uh, mentor who taught uh, at UCLA from 1950 to 1956. He taught lettering. But then from 1956 through the late 70s, Maury taught calligraphy at UCLA Extension, and that's where I got to know him. I started studying with him in 1971. In 1956, he received an 11-page letter from Lloyd Reynolds on how to organize a calligraphy class and teach it. That's such a remarkable thing. Donald Jackson now um, has uh, started offering workshops in the United States. So he offered his first two workshops on calligraphy and illumination at UC Santa Cruz summer extension workshops in June and July of 1973. Phyllis Caven took the one week course. The three week course was attended by 32 students, including Los Angelinos Pat Topping, Chuck Medinis, and Larry Brady. A lecture was squeezed in between the workshops. About 130 people attended. Donald strongly encouraged the participants to form a calligraphy organization like the Society of Scribes and Illuminators in England, which lit a bonfire of enthusiasm in both San Francisco and Los Angeles. The piece on the right is an alphabet in gold with gum ammoniac, which I got from Donald in 1975. 
So uh, just to set the stage as if this were a play, um, the, there were calligraphy co organizations before the Society for the Calli Calligraphy, the Western American branch of the Society for Italic Handwriting, um, which was based on Edward Johnston's Society for Italic Handwriting. Um, and um, that's how we got involved with Lloyd Reynolds, the Society for Calligraphers in 1950 to 1956, the one Maury was uh, involved in as a professional organization in LA. And then of course, the Society of Scribes and Illuminators, uh, which was founded in England in 1929. And it was wonderful that Donald encouraged us to become lay members if, they, if we wanted to, uh, which allowed me to be able to write to them and find out where I could study in England. And my first person I chose to study with was David Howells, which of course, besides Donald changing my life, so did David. So. I'm so grateful that he encouraged us to do that. And I'm sure that's still the case that you can do so. But what really happened in Los Angeles was that Phyllis Caven came back and talked this over with her husband and said, oh, we have to get Donald here. And so a lecture, uh, uh, sorry, a lecture at LACMA and workshop at the uh, Norman Simon Museum were quickly organized by Phyllis and Mel Caven for August 14th, 1973. They pulled out all the stops, got support from the Graphic Arts Council at LACMA, Los Angeles County Museum of Art, Dawson's Bookshop, Catercraft's Bookbinders, which was their own business, and Zaitlin and Verbrugge Booksellers. Maury Nimoy calligraphed the lo lovely invitation to these events. And Donald said later, that was the night that the SFC found itself as a community. So that's a very significant happening. So, um, here's the supporting cast, what really uh, literally happened to get this organization started. And I want to encourage you that if you're in a place where you don't have an organization, that you can start one too. Here's the template. So what we did, we were in Maureen Nimoy's 1973 class and um, several of us uh, were encouraging him to start this organization, but he didn't want to do it himself because he'd already been there, done that. And he said he would be helpful. So the first exploratory meeting was set at Miriam Halperin's house, who was in that same class, in North Hollywood on November 2nd, 1973. An ad hoc committee was established right away and met over the next three months to develop the bylaws and basic structure of the organization. So here's Maury Nimoy at the right opening the champagne at the party at Miriam Halperin's house and um, other pictures of people who uh, attended the party. Uh, Lloyd Reynolds came down from Oregon to commune with us. So he's on the left and on the right. On the right, he's talking to Miriam Halperin. Marsha Brady here is talking to Maury at the party. And here I am talking to uh, Miriam in the middle and uh, Maury Nimoy's wife, Margie, at the right. So the ad hoc committee started meeting on December 7th and met several times over the next uh, several months. To the right are questions that were to be discussed at the first meeting in December, written out by Pat Topping. And then we had our very first official meeting on February 2nd, 1974. Participants convened at the Museum of Science and Industry and voted to accept the bylaws, which had been mailed to prospective members and thus began the first official meeting of the Society for Calligraphy. At the right is the letter written by Maury Nimoy to attract charter members. And on February 2nd, also, the SFC voted to change the ad hoc committee title to the Interim Board of Governors. So the, we developed the mission statement. The purpose of the society shall be to promote the study and critical practice of calligraphy as a craft and as an art form, to encourage individual excellence, and to foster a wider appreciation and deeper understanding of calligraphy, its history and applications, by the free interchange of ideas and techniques. So uh, right away, we went up to uh, Manuka, a retreat up in uh, Portland, Oregon, and uh, discussed how to structure our SFC future retreats, uh, whether or not we would do weathergrams like we did up in Oregon or not. So the annual general meeting was set to be in May 1974 with Lloyd Reynolds. There was a presentation of the board and a vote on the officer slate. And this is a list of some of the past board members. So I was on the board for three years and president in that third year. So just to remind you that Donald kept on coming back to LA, which just delighted us. So uh, he came to LA again in 1974 and taught a 
three week course in calligraphy and illumination, which I was able to take. And here are some of the people involved in that course. And of course, in the course, what he would have us do would be to select a page from um, a medieval manuscript and replicate it with gold and um, uh, gouache and so on. So this is a page from the second Bible of Charles the Bald. So what is the aftermath of all of this? This is all of these things are what Donald did for us and for the world. The significance of the establishment of SFC. We were up to 1400 members by 1985. Other US calligraphy organizations soon followed, the first groups being in New York City and San Francisco. Currently, there are 98 calligraphy organizations in the US and 16 in Canada. National conferences were established. The first one was energized by Donald Jackson. It was in Minnesota, organized by Joe White. There was a huge proliferation of classes on calligraphy, all kinds of calligraphy. Newsletters and journals were developed. The public became aware of good calligraphy and advertisements and on signs. Specialized supply story stores uh, developed and uh, there was a trickle down effect. Art stores started carrying supply tools and papers and manufacturers started providing tool sets and calligraphy paper pads. And currently SFC has an uptick in global members because of Zoom presentations. And this is a very good example of how you can have a global reach through this wonderful Zoom platform. So the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Society for Calligraphy will be celebrated in 2024. And you'll find the complete story of the founding of the Society for Calligraphy on their YouTube channel, including an appearance by Donald Jackson, uh, which gave us the idea to invite him to give this fantastic lecture series. So we're just about to start uh, with Donald, but I'd like to say that you may enter your questions for Donald in the chat room during his presentation. You'll see the chat at the bottom of your screen with the word C-H-A-T in like a little bubble. He'll answer selected questions from the audience at the end of his presentation. I will present those to him. And then please type three question marks or the word question first to make it easier for me to gather questions during his talk to present to Donald at the end of our session. He'll be talking for about an hour. So I'd like to present to you our favorite calligraphy in the whole, calligrapher in the whole wide world, Donald Jackson. I'll stop the share now. Well, thank you very much. That was a rather impressive. I couldn't believe you were talking about me actually, but we, uh, we we're here now and I must say that uh, right away that my presentation will be nowhere near as uh, crisp and um, efficient as yours has been. It's given me uh, uh, a really good, it's given everyone a really good idea of the sort of art historical, if you like, background to, to your group. And um, uh, the way I wanted to talk tonight was um, really but just purely my own experience and my own time uh and so the backstory of anybody's personal experience in their own time is is the the backstory keeps wanting to push through so if i'm talking about how i first learned picked up a pen and so on i have to talk about when it was in my life and how it was because it that is universal we, we look back from where we're sitting here. Uh, we're sitting here in our own time now, and we each of us so have a completely different view of, of what we see when we look back, even if in identical circumstances, it would seem. Now, I, I suppose what I believe I'm being asked to do, and, and Kitty has outlined it again, uh, um, but the description of what we're supposed to be doing together while we're spending this time uh, over this next uh, four sessions. Um, but really, the way I'm being perhaps quite in self-indulgent, but I'm trying to paint a picture of what it really was like uh, as a child and what we, I mean, I don't know about you, but things are moving so fast now that it's almost impossible to look back at a photograph and think, can that have been in my lifetime? Because it looks so long ago in my case, I've got to say. But anyway, let's start. I, I wanted to talk about um, 
Um, let's start, start with where we are right here. Um, now I'd like to, this, this um, is where we are now sitting this evening. When I say we, we are sitting in this room here. I probably that I'm looking out at that window at the world. And with me in the room is Carla's, Carla's Riva, who's uh, is the, doing the tech support. Um, and we should really have a little picture of you if we can find you. Um, I can do some, uh, some click if you like. There's Carla's there, who's uh, uh, looking after the cameras and so on. And shrinking over there at the door is, is Sarah, who for 19 years has worked here, all the way through the Bible, um and um project among other things and she was a studio manager um uh, for except for the first five years and we know it took a lot longer than that and she's still here helping us uh um in the studio and uh, the um so ooh, what i'm really struggling with is trying trying to give you a sort of sketch of the main idea I'm what I'm thinking is that people will, can see through what I went through or what they are going through and have gone through. And the art history of it all is comes in later in the series when we Kitty talked about the, um, the founding of calligraphy guilds, there were calligraphy guilds in the US long before I showed up, as she mentioned, but even before that. And uh it's just that um the timing was there and in, in that's the whole cultural and art historical uh set of reasons and life is just about the timing and time and time again throughout um through throughout my little story um, we, um things happen i didn't make happen they happened and i was there then or, or i wasn't there you know, and that applies to us all. But let's start, shall we say, at um, let's start with with traditionally. I haven't given many talks for a number of years. I only uh, very rarely turn up for to, to to do that. A lot of it was to do with the Bible. But very often and traditionally, I start in the same sort of way, which is I will try to get the audience to imagine themselves writing because this is what it is. I've got a reed pen in my hand. Just filled it full of red ink. And this is a lot of you will recognize this as being This is what it's about. It's about how that feels. It's about how that pen feels, how it grabs the surface. Listen, if I press, if I do it quickly, that. It's about moving this dribble of ink here so that it's glistening in the light or whatever, maybe not seeing it so well on this, but it's about that. What is it that makes us want to experience that feeling from here from our hearts that make, making the marks so normally if i was in a public space with you i'd be inviting you to follow me with your fingers or your arms as you go down there look up stop interestingly that mark there when my finger is supposed to be there. My pen, my hand is miles away, watch. It, it's here. That mark stopped there. My hand, it contains the momentum and I let go of it. And then back again, eyeballing it and then coming through and going and throwing my arm with it. So we can throw ourselves into these marks. That is what calligraphy is. And then also we get more and more control 
as time goes by um, and um, so that our hearts can be more involved in each of the marks we make. And so that's our grounding, it's pen, it's ink, it's a feeling within us that drives us to do these frustrating sort of attempts to, to create a sort of inner perfection or whatever. So we, we, this is what it's about. I, I would, I can talk about why I think, I think you see, we start, um, we are so complex in our minds, in our bodies, we, we, end, we are what our memories are. We arrive already fully wired to be able to process uh, an experience. We, with that, we put it into our memory and before long we have another experience. And without us knowing that those, those connections are going on, any decision we make, any mark we make has been, is informed by this um, masses of, of um, information that has been gathering and gathering that makes us who we are. And we, this is where our inspiration comes from. We don't know, inspiration comes only when we ask for it. And this is part of what my talk is about always. It's about trying to find a way of going within to find inspiration. It comes, it waiting for you, it waiting for you to let it. And so let's start by me knowing nothing, being a child, um, attending school, um, uh, born in 1938. So two years before what for us was the start of uh, the war. I'm going to have to move this paper here. I can't see the screen. That's it. Um, that's good. Thank you. Um, I was born in a little street somewhere around about there. My mother's family were coal miners. My mother worked in one of these mills when she was a girl. I walked up the street here as a child and I went in here to that little chapel school there. Uh, behind which that's the chapel and behind it was a school. Now in that school, um, I first was given my first calligraphy pens and ink. And in the midst of this industrial place, there was a good teacher who encouraged uh, us and I need to look at my notes for a sec because I need to know where I'm going to next. I'm jumping from this. Um, um, uh, I'll tell you where it is. I'll tell you, I'll tell you where I'm going. I'm, I want to go to where the elephant in the room is. Um, you know, why are we talking about writing um, and making marks and letters at a time when quite frankly the world is on fire california knows that as much as anybody does or it's in danger of being drowned uh, we're fighting a, a an international disease which we can't really control uh, we're fighting each other big time and yet in the midst of all this we're talking about doing lettering and, and, and concerning ourselves with the flow of ink on a surface and things of that kind. Well, I, I, I'm not new to this. Um, like anybody my age, I was born into a world which was at war. Um, my father was away in the, in the, in the armed services. Um, we were living in a town like you just saw um there was no 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 windows light coming out of the windows because for years we were every evening when it grew dark we had to cover them the windows up to stop lights being shown would attract bombs to fall on our heads so we we were living in that right reality but the child makes its own reality 
however, that was the case. And um, uh, so on top of that, going from that after the war ended, um, with shortages and so on and so forth, we then went straight into a Cold War. So then the atomic bomb. Now, by the time I reached my teens, I mean, the thought of the, of the nuclear extinction was every bit as real as the fear one might have of COVID entering the family house, at the, because it was there. And by the time I got to Central School of Art, when I was 19, and I first met Irene Wannington, I said to her, you know, I can't get any ideas because what's the point of it? What's the point of doing calligraphy when the world is in the state it's in? And I had been literally reared with it in it. Um, so not that this, you know, I have a right to claim a lot of similarity to the present moment. But as then, as then, she said to me, look, she pointed to me uh, a quotation in the, in the um, uh, introduction to Edward Johnson's book that he must have chosen by Ralph uh, Emerson uh, to say, look, there always will be problems. There always will be things outside. There will always be the world trying to sort itself out. And they'll look at you doing your calligraphy, or in his case, the writing, he was saying. And they'll say, don't do that. Get on with trying to do. He said, just do that. Put a line every day. And when all of this fuss is carrying on, at the end of it, you will have something to show. And I thought, well, then I thought, Okay, but isn't that like hiding, putting your head in the sand? That's me as a 19 year old thinking. I was glad to take the opportunity of thinking that that was an excuse to forget everything and just do what I wanted to do, which I wanted. Um, and, but it, she was right. Because what you do is when, you're not putting your head in the sand when you sit with your at your desk with all the hell get letting loose around you and take your pen. You're going into and creating a space into which you can expand, not shrink from. You create your own inner world as a child does and you make your marks and add a line a day and you will have something to show for it. Um, uh, it, it's something to hang on to, I think, at, at, at times like this. Our work is a bigger world, it's the inner world, than the one which we are having to deal with on a daily basis. Um, but having said that, we can create a world of our own with letters, and, you know, that's one of the reasons you're signing up, because you're interested in this. Um, and. Uh, um so uh the only thing is i can talk philosophically about it but i think um just on a regular thing you better get some decent pair of glasses you may be, have to be prepared to go out and get some more glasses if when you really start having to look at things uh, in the way that we do um so um I think uh, what we'll do is start again with back to the slides and um, I'll move on. So I think I just do that, don't I? And this um, little angelic child um, was sitting in the, those behind a desk in that school, thinking the most angelic thoughts. Um, and this is uh, me trying to look angelic. I consciously did when we had that school photograph um, because all the time I was thinking of how I could get the pigtails of the girl who sat in front of me to dribble into the inkwell, um, which I had filled especially full, because I had been promoted to the ink monitor's job, where I was able to make the ink every morning, um, uh, every week, um, and, and it spend a good hour getting myself covered in head to foot 
with ink, um, where I poured it into all the little china ink wells which sat in the desks. Um, but this was the world that I lived in. Coal mines outside, factories, um, um, cotton mills, um, men and women working in them. This was the world that I went to school along the towpath of that canal. Um, um, a few years later, those big mill, that's a big cotton mill behind. The coal came from the pits, went onto the barges, the barges went from the canals out to more mills. That was the world that was, was a very unpromising sort of world, you might think, for somebody wanting to do things with calligraphy. There were people who, but there were positive things. People made things. I was part of a culture. And this is the back story pushing through from, from behind. You had the culture of work and making things and also making them well. You were not respected if you produced shoddy work. And I was brought up in the world of shopkeeping family, my father and grandfather and before that farmers, but this is the sort of shop I used to walk past. I, as a child, and not that younger child either, this was uh, the, the, my father's bicycle shop and before him, my grandfather's um, and my grand, but um, you won't see it, but here and there, these little tickets, all handwritten and hand painted the prices and this, that and the other were all done by my dad, who was very um, interested in sign writing and making little jobs. This is one of his Christmas cards he sent to us when he was in the Navy during the war. So obviously handy with lettering um, and a brush, lettering brush. Uh, there he is, Wolf, my father there. Um, so I'm talking about these little memories that are in the back of our brains in our memory, which all figure in what decisions we make, the kind of graphics that I was probably seeing. I didn't think of it, but I did used to look at these hand lettered um, posters, which were outside movie theaters and um, um, uh, stores. These are all hand painted. Um, these probably not, um, but these were all part of the influences. You've got your father. And then at the school, um, when I'd finished my work um, on my school work, my headmaster had, it turns out after the First World War, had gone into the teacher training college in London and he had learned to do calligraphy. And he had a few books with these old fashioned Victorian sort of letters. This is one where you, it, this is, you get to color in your own um, copy of what's on the left. All very inaccurate, it's all done on, made by lithography, meaning actually on stone. And also he had um, books with illuminated letters in it and that kind. And he would just give me a pen and ink and um, another friend of mine, and once we'd done our homework, uh, uh, he, he set us to do this. So that is luck. That is what is luck. Uh, that in amongst all of that industrial life, where you really what everybody was supposed to do was to get trained to get out and work and make things or dig things up um, from the ground. Um, he is showing me this. Well, of course, I did have quite nice handwriting, and I was did love to make letters in the air. They were never as good as the ones I did on the paper, but this was, where are those seeds? They're in so many of us, so many of us. And they're these little seeds of memory, both inherited and, um, in, and in the influences around us. Now, um, I think, um, uh, um, uh let's see where we are um i'd like i'm just looking at my notes here now while i'm floundering about just uh while i see um what happens right what what happens to a kid who's got interested in things like this 
Well, the idea was you didn't. You, this is something you played at and you got on with the real business of life of getting an education, passing exams. And um, if you were very fortunate, you'd get to go to a school which had an academic leanings. Uh, if you weren't, if you weren't, you ended up um, in the factory um, with everybody else to a school which was devoted to it. So can I have uh, the next one, please? Um, so here we go. I don't quite know what's coming up, um, but it will. Um, um, I actually, from being a kid that was prospering, doing well in that little church, grimy little church school, I, 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 I liked it. I won prizes. I, I was encouraged to do the things that obviously the man had an instinct that I was good at, but I flunked the exams that got you into the school that made a new life possible. I ended up getting really nervous and um, uh, just flunked it. And I ended up going to this school, nice lads, but you left at 15 and you were definitely being groomed to go down the coal mine. Uh, this was my pal here. He went to the coal mine and he was down there for 36 years. This is me. I got rescued from that school um, by a, a frustrated teacher who had been trying to teach calligraphy or doing some lettering with lettering nibs in the classroom next door. And nobody seemed to be able to get it. And he came into the classroom, interrupted the teacher of the lesson I was in, and he said to me, you can do this sort of thing. Come and show my class that it can really be done because they can't make head or tail of it. So I was plucked from that, aged probably 12, taken next door, showed the fact that you could do it because, of course, as I told you, I had been given nibs in the, and pens in the previous school, and the, and the teacher, and that stuck in that teacher's mind. So the following year, I was still on this awful business of having to go. I hated sport. I was in with all of the only thing that that school cared about, really, in the main, was football. And uh, because they were killing time before they left and went to the real world. But I was rescued by that accidental series of accidents. Say what you like, because an advertisement came up from the, uh, an art college which gave scholarships to 13 year olds to go and study there for two years and then perhaps go on. And because of me helping him out with his, um, his, uh, his uh, lesson, um, I transferred to a school with instead of 43 children crammed into a a, a class every day. I there's me looking quite s smug there um, uh, at an art college, so that the guy here had it so just qualified, and he had spent two years doing calligraphy and illuminating, uh, or maybe even more, uh, not as a specialist subject. So there we are. I mean, this is all very, very um, detailed. I know probably too much. But what I'm saying is this is it, real people in, in, a, in a place where there was very little information. This, this is how I got to, into that, fortunately, into the art, away from the industry and away from the, the muddy football field. Um, and this, there were two or three books. This is one. And this sort of no color in them. There was red. But that's it. This book was uh, Let um, Lettering of Today was published first in 1937 with, um, with uh, editions. And Sheila Waters will recognize this very well because she, she appears in it, apparently. She appears in the next one, next. And this piece of work I saw, and it looked very like the lettering on the, on the wall that my old headmaster had done and in a panel that I one my very one of my very first days at school. So this was a sharpened italic and 
very classy, actually, because he's contrasted it with the Greek and then the dense Gothic and then the panels of texture underneath. And so that was in that book. So I saw that. And in the same book, in that same lettering of today, published in 1937, again, very poor print. I'm not making any apologies for this not being a, um, a crisp um, image. It wasn't in the original, it wasn't in the book. You try to look at that closely and there is nothing there to learn from in a way. This was a Irene Wellington again. I mean, quite different from the Gothic. Um, a, a wonderfully, um, this is a diary she did in 1933. So what, I'm, what am I doing here? I'm talking about these influences, the, the things that were there for me to see, not much. And actually what there was not in very good shape. I was fascinated by the decoration that went with the illumination. Something I loved about this. Now this is a, a monotone, a monotone mono, anyway, it's just black and white. And it's very poorly reproduced in the copy I have. Um, again, you know, if I blow that up 10 times, you'll see less and less every time I blow it up. Um, unlike now with the digital um, um, technology, we can see more. But I, there's something, something attracted me about this. Uh, and also the another and the same, just again, this is just in this is just in the what seemed to me boring old Edward Johnson was because I was just went over my head the wisdom in it at that time. I looked at this Grayley Hewitt, who again loved lots of decoration and gold. I didn't know that there was gold. I didn't know how to do gold. The only the other staple book for me to look at, I and mean, this is so hard for you to even say, why is he going on about this? There were no other books. There were no other books set, uh, showing you what calligraphy could be. And in this one, this one was published after the war. And I put that there because it shows you that there was far more, there was far more work from the continent. So you've got this, um, uh, just, you know, more designerly use of, of text. Still, the English was still going after the Edward Johnston. And that was typical of the kind of lettering that was going on in the art colleges. Um, the, uh, uh, also in that same book, I see the name of a person called M.C. Oliver, Mervyn C. Oliver. There again, you can see that Johnstonian pointed, sharpened Gothic. That was the style that was being taught, that was available. At the same time, in the same book, you have uh, one of these illuminated addresses uh, um, to the Queen done by Irene Wellington. So um, I'm looking at these things. I'm in Bolton. I'm in the middle of the more cotton mills. I mean, I only moved a few miles away from the little town I was showing you the photographs of earlier, uh, which was another industrial town. And it was like being on a desert island, really, and but with these books, even though I was in an art college. Let's let's be honest about this. Calligraphy has always been a very much a minority subject. Um, by this time, it was getting less so. Um, Sheila Waters has a, a lot of information on this herself, and because she was part of it, like I was just a few years earlier. And um, so, in that same book, um, was a piece of work by Sheila Waters. Uh, um, and you can see it's a world away uh, from uh, uh, from uh, sorry uh, from that one and that one that one that is becoming more more airy more modern I might say and more more classical. But you see, look that slide there. I mean, you look at that closely. It's just a load of dots because they were very badly produced. We take so much for granted, brilliant um, printing now, that wasn't there. But I like that, but I also like the decoration as well. I like the one with more decoration. And I had another book, but I didn't know how to gild. I did have a teacher, he just encouraged me, the young guy I showed you the film of, the picture of in the schoolyard. 
but he it was a subsidiary subject for him he just just helped me a lot he just helped me encouraged me found space for me and in that book um you know penmanship um, by somebody called um, miss ockenden um very good diagrams but this was all i had to go on diagrams didn't have to show me gilding or cut a quill um so there's that that those those books were the only ones there was johnston the um, lettering of the day, modern lettering of calligraphy. I recommend you, if you could get hold of them, and you can in second hand, um, obviously, to get them and have a look at that, to see that period. Letterpress, again, not very crisp. And then this is the bit of art history too, was the other pull, pull, was the fact that that was in existence and the sort of thing against which people like William Morris and Edward Johnson were sort of again fighting against was this, this, this sort of DIY um, monetizing of a sort of hobby um, um, which came off the back of the arts and crafts uh, movement which looked over its shoulder at uh, the Middle Ages and you get a book like this illuminating with these copy me things in it and books this was the style that's what you might call in the us for instance the scroll shop style which has a powerful a powerful grip on what people think calligraphy should be like um, you know with a lot of decoration and um it looks like the people who spent the money on that no, if I had done a very plain piece of calligraphy, I think people would always choose that rather than a plain piece. And here we have something. This is the 1930s, well into the you know period where Irene Wellington was working and so on. And this is a catalogue of illuminated addresses, um, all set prices. You order one, and so on and so forth. So that this was a pull as well. These are all influences that go into a young mind. And I was floundering uh, at that point. Um, so um, the um, I turned, I turned, I was saying to myself, uh, I was saying to myself this, this is a note I wrote as a sort of 18, 19 year old in the back of my Edward Johnson copy. Try, try to do a bit of gilding. Um, um, take um, my folio, look at Grainy Hewitt's, look at this. I didn't know quite which way to turn, but um, I turn to the first original calligraphy I've seen, which was in old manuscripts and it so happened within my locality there were a sprinkling of libraries each of which had a few of these illuminated letter books in them and i could copy them from the real page i could see an illuminated thing with that ink on that parchment and so i began to get my first learning from not from those books. I got learning from those books, but it was at a distance, which was, it was too heavily screened for me. When I looked at um, uh, that, and if you read, I, I can't see it because it's covered over by my little, what's it on the right hand side. But I'm actually writing, I was copying a medieval manuscript, but I broke into my English and I'm saying, I am having trouble with this vellum. I don't know what is going on. I've scratched it, I've done this, I've done that. I'm actually writing it on the skin. Um, this is the Flandering student. Um, and so um, I need to get on and away from here. I didn't mention that alongside this course I was doing in the, in, in, in the nearby town art college I also did book learning and I had to do it because you couldn't get a, uh, they couldn't offer a degree level course in calligraphy it had to be calligraphy and something else calligraphy was never really in that at that point uh, in time was not sufficiently um, regarded as being a, a grown-up subject really 
enough. Well, not enough self, it didn't justify itself. You had to have something else with it. Right, now, um, I went on, copied things, didn't all work, gold fell off. Um, I copied this uh, from a postcard, but I was getting the hang of some of this gilding from the book, getting it wrong. I was working under, an, under a lamp all the time, which was drying out the gesso without me knowing that that's something that you didn't need. Uh, but somehow or other, I got some level of skill copying learning from the real things my own personal work which was for my exams and my uh, you know which we were working towards was floundering massively i was being influenced by the um by the johnstonian and the um, mc oliver more than anything i was trying to think of things to do I was my exam piece here is far more um um more like the lettering of, 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 of MC Oliver. You may never have heard of him, but he was the senior uh, lecturer at the Central School of Art. And he also was the chief examiner for the calligraphy for the, to the UK or for, the, uh, for um, England and Wales. And this was my exam piece, part of it, my sketch. Um, that I'd set, there's a detail of it. In here I had leaves with gold in between each of these white spaces. I was had in the back of my mind, still bugging me, that illumined, that um, muzzy page in Johnson's book where everything was crawling. And so I look, where else do I go? What else? I knew I didn't, I wasn't good. I knew I wasn't good enough. Everyone else did because they didn't know. They didn't, I told myself they didn't know. And so I looked up Central School of Art, and who's on, who are the teaching? Oliver, Irene Wellington, Joan Pillsbury, I never did teach with. And it says, these classes follow the tradition of Edward Johnston, and it's on the chisel edge pen, vellum, um, quills, formal writing, based on history. None of that I had ever done other than on my own. Um, but that was the state of things, and that was then 19... 57. Here is MC Oliver sitting there doing one of his example examples. Um, that's a piece of his work. So you can see the drift. This is the style. There was no modern, it wasn't looked at as an art form. Art, um, art and calligraphy was not something that was sat easily with the, um, with the arts and crafts movement. Um, it could be useful but it couldn't, necess it couldn't be start to take upon itself as of and graces of, of, of art, even though, and here we have Irene Wellington, this is the other part of the team, and this is her work, much more romantic, much more, um, more to my taste, actually, so it, it so happened. But he was the chief examiner, and so guess whose work I was going to be following? Uh, he said, when I first went there, you need to do be a, you're never going to make a living at calligraphy. You're going to have to learn sign writing as well. So he sent me to his friend uh, who um, used to do what was called painter lettering at another art college um, in London. And I worked with him in the evenings. He did this kind of things and lots and lots of um, elegant lettering on buildings and that sort of thing. And so um, Oliver took charge of me, he said, evenings with um, William Sharpington, you've got one day a week with Mrs. Wellington, uh, I can, you can have one day a week with me at college here, if you want to come, you can follow me to another place he used to teach at for another two days, and you need to do some book binding on another day, because frankly, you need to be able to turn your hand to anything. And if you do it like me, you'll you've got there because I have, he says here, in, modernized by Edward Johnston and MCO. He thought he had improved on Johnston and therefore we should then copy him. And if we copied him, we'd pass our exam. Next, that's true. This is another of his sheets. Again, change based on Johnston, based on Johnston bases on this. It's gone quite away from it. 
and there's himself sitting there as he's in his, as a 20 year old in his in his digs uh, rooms just room uh, just um, a few few a quarter of a mile from central school i just gave you some this is what we were expected to do this is what the teacher did and that's what we're supposed to do he was very helpful to me he helped me gave me the right materials to do gesso this is oliver he had them he wasn't himself interested in gilding but he had good materials and of course i had been working hard failing so much in my you know 300 miles away in in the north of england and as soon as he saw me doing this he obviously realized i could do it and i was overjoyed when i felt that gold grip that gesso and then shine back at you um, and this is just a part and of course later on i got to be more free with it and um we can go back to that at another point so um this is it this is typical student work so this is our history as it happened in microscopic detail i admit but this is my progress from those old works from the um not being able to do it getting it wrong to getting the chance to do it more right as it were and this was a typical kind of student um, assignment um i was interested in religious symbolism why well partly because of the copies i had done earlier i suppose and partly because i felt that this kind of rich um, formal detail and design belonged to something more solid than student pieces as it were and somehow or other it seemed to marry it wasn't that i was religious particularly at all um it was that what i wanted to do was best said in this way it was the the words i wanted i was looking for words to justify my 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 designs to be honest and so i graduated with this as a piece after I'd been, after all those years I'd been in art college, I was starting to get some way of doing something which were in fresh colors, different from medieval, using medieval details, um, designing my own things, and you know, actually, um, and working confidently in gold, the lettering not very good, but the, but the gold was. And so, you can see how the progress was happening. So, um, but again, there's just to explain, this was bright silver, which has gone black over the years, because this was done in um, 1958. So it's had a lot of uh, years on it. So um, that's that, and I move over to that and that. So, Irene Wellington, this is going on but this is close detail you won't get elsewhere because you know you have to be a certain age to be able to know this um she worked away um and came into london every week and took a, a, a class this was a piece of her work that a detail of which from from earlier that i'd been familiar with she could draw she went to art school she studied um in kent i think um and and she um was a good student i mean and meant meant business and she had a different way she was playing with the with the with the calligraphy and, and drawing with it and she was a, a beautiful draftsman um and here she was we became friends at the time that i was a student she didn't understand me and i certainly didn't understand her and uh, we she then when i got to know her apologized um quite unnecessarily for not being able to help me as much as she would have liked and it turned out uh, that she assumed because i had already was a postgraduate i went there as a postgraduate student she assumed i knew i knew more than i did um, i could do stuff that looked on the surface good and again copying and to some extent not copying and this one piece of work at the end of my studies uh, in uh, calligraphy, um, which I, I ended when I was 20, um, was very much in between the two. 
it was in between my tutor, my senior tutor, Oliver, and my, and my the teacher, of Irene Wellington. And the point is, um, it, it, and it perfectly explains where I was. I was in the middle of nowhere, but I was moving. The very last thing I did before I left Central School was a little thesis, and it's much more owes to Irene Wellington's way of spacing and the light and the air and the forms. So, um, at the end of it, and I came across this the other day, and by the way, um, we are going to have to, you know, I've got some time, but I mean, we'll, we may run over, but I will, um, we can catch up on whatever is important enough in next session. But this, this is what I felt about myself. I, I mean, I came, I've been looking through some old stuff, obviously, uh, you know, in order to talk about this. And I came across this diary entry um, after I left Central School in my handwriting saying that. And it's what I felt because I didn't understand about letter form. I was just skimming off the top. I'd never really learned it. I'd never been taught it. And it, that inferiority sense of inferiority stayed with me for so long because um, I had another year of college to do, but that was really to do with teaching um, rather than uh, no talk, no instruction in lettering. In fact, you weren't to do the thing you specialized in in art college. You were supposed to do other things. So um, I'm just trying to find out where I jumped to now. But I did one last piece at, uh, at the next college I went to, the teaching college, because um, I, um, I had to do another thesis. And of course, me being me, I took the lazy way out and stole things from the work I'd done in the previous year uh, because that was the quickest way to do it. And so you can see me pulling together um, a version of what I did in the previous final piece, my, my diploma piece. And um, the book I did, the thesis was on religious symbolism again. But again, there was a difference. It was getting more mature, uh, more, uh, the detail more, much more related to Irene Wellington. Um, I was using liner prints instead of laborious other things. And that there ended um, my um, tuition um, at, at college. And that was literally the only time. Now, okay, by that time I was already teaching in an art college um, I was moonlighting um, and um, teaching uh, as a visiting lecturer evening classes at another London art college where I was teaching calligraphy and illumination myself. Um, with um, the gilding got me the job because somebody had seen um, a piece of work that I'd done in an exhibition and it had a lot of gilding on it and that um, must have stuck in their minds and they needed somebody to do that. And so um, we're, I'm, I'm sort of stopping a bit now because this is all very, very focused on me, but it's not, it's, it's focusing, basically the thread is on how do we learn, how do we develop and how do we um, absorb other people's influences and struggle to make them our own. Um, I uh, am conscious that, um, yeah, there is a, one last little thing. Um, I'm going to leave my notes and leave my um, other th thoughts. Um, uh, and in order to give you a bit of a chance to um, ask questions, but um, where was I? I had a world, I had to teach. What I haven't mentioned is, when I talked about the world I lived in, is that when you were 18, unless you were either in training or disabled in some way or another, you had to go in the army or you had to go in the armed forces for two years. Where there was a Korean War, there were other parts of our dwindling empire that seemed to need defending, and we were all at boys at age of 18 
dropped everything, and apart from an apprenticeship, as I said, and they had to go into the army. So this was the kind of world one was living in. I, uh, uh, and in the final year of the teaching, they changed the policy. And from then on, I had to go into education, teaching kids uh, up to the age of 15, or go into the army and teach soldiers who weren't very well educated because neither were going to have to be sacked, fired and go into, into, the, um, into the world of work. Um, so I had either the chance of going in the army or going into secondary school. So that really, in a way, was accounting for the next two years. I had to do that. But at the same time I was teaching, at the same time I was doing sign painting jobs, I was doing lettering jobs for my um, old teacher, uh, Mr. Sharpington, who did painting. Um, but I wanted to do more. And this is where, and full circle, um, Kitty um, uh, very well explained, or very well pointed out, the function of, 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 um, of, of societies. There was something called the Society of Scribes and Illuminators. I knew about it because my teachers were members of it. And this was where you could see other people and more work, listen to them, talk about it, and so on. And so that enables us to share. If you're, I mean, we tend to be solitary in calligraphers. Uh, we work very alone. And to go and mix with others and share what we know and what we don't know is has been the driving force between that's the basis of it we just want that fellowship um, um and it's not just straightforward pragmatic grabbing at knowledge um it's of being part of something and getting the support for what that instinct that we have for doing things um is that we we get some um, um you know, justification somehow or other. But anyway, the final shot on this is, uh, on the work, is that I, Heather Child was uh, another important person. She was a calligrapher and she published books uh, later. Um, and I met her through, she was a student of Oliver's and I met her as I did others. And, um, other calligraphers who I had established, people whose names I'd seen in books and things of that kind. And she said to me, um, you put things in an exhibition for two reasons. Either they're things you've got and you want to sell them and make some money from them, or you put things in exhibitions, which are the sort of things you hope people will ask you to do. And it's interesting what I, there were two exhibitions cropped up that I had the opportunity to put work in. And I, and this is after college, no teachers uh, supporting this time. You had, you, this was sitting in that room where you saw me with my tweed suit and, uh, and, and waistcoat and tie and stiff collar working, um, not much differently from Edward Johnston's and actually a quarter of a mile away than from where Edward Johnson was working um, in 1906. Um, um, and I'll just show you these last three uh, or two, I must, uh, slides, and um, they're coming up. Um, and um, this is one, and this was a uh, a sort of Irene Wellington um, scroll that was done for the royal, for the Queen, which had this ribbon going down the side. So um, I was looking, that, thinking that that was a source of income, that people um, still gave these things to each other on civic occasions and ceremonial times. I thought, well, there is some way I'm going to be able to make a living doing that. Obviously, I had the teaching, but um, I didn't want to do that, particularly as a, as, as a full time. And um, so I, I was actually asked to do this scroll um, by three of them for a, uh, uh, for a, a city 
um, celebrating his 700th year of incorporation up in the in the north. And I did the sketches and the client was uh, very happy and I suddenly got a notice to say, sorry, but when this design was put before the council, this is of the elected elected, elected officers, um, they said, why are we going to London for this? Why don't we get it done, you know, in, the, in this town? So they scrapped my design and took somebody who was doing it um, part time somewhere and I lost the job, but I had the sketch. And so when an exhibition came up, I took the sketch, did it as a finished piece. Now, it looks very, you know, I was taken from Wellington, but I was, um, I was actually making my own sort of stars, if you like, and starbursts and trying to something else falling off. But um, I think it's uh, Rimsky Korsakov said, you, um, you don't imitate other people, you steal from them. And so um, we are all of us magpies. And this is uh, what we have to keep our eyes open for, uh, looking around. And there you see the, the writings rather all over the place. This is after all the studies I've done, but with no real basis, no basic stuff. And guess what? The second piece was, it was obviously heavy due to um, religious art. And it was, that was 1960, um, I think. And, um, and that again was done for an exhibition. And uh, it took, I think, what was that, 1960 to 1998. Uh, so that's almost 40 years before somebody asked me to write the Bible. So um, that was uh, Heather, me taking Heather Child's advice. I didn't think it was going to take quite so long to pay off. Um, so right, thank you for the slides. Uh, thank you for watching all this. It's all very uh, autobiographical, but the, I'll pull it together in the end, if I may. But right now, I mean, um, you know, you know more than anybody ever has actually about um, what went into me being sitting here looking and talking with you all tonight, or tonight my time. Um, and so um, anybody who would like to ask questions, which do you think will be of interest to not just you, but to as many other people, then I'm, I'm going to just have a glass of water and we'll have spend a little while talking about that. Um, I suppose we've got 10 minutes possibly. So thank you for that and perhaps I take some questions. Thank you very much, Donald. That was exactly what I was hoping that you would uh, discuss about uh, how you got your training and I didn't expect all of the uncertainty and and uh, doubting yourself. So, you know, we're all there with that. <laughs> Still do, unfortunately. Well, so thank you very much. Um, there, there are a lot of questions um, that are, some that are particular about the materials that you were able to use and some of them um, just being put in there right now. So I'll start, out with, I'll start out with some of the questions that are kind of particular that might be helpful um, to just pin those down first and then the more sort of philosophical. Oh. So uh, the first questions uh, started with with when you were <laughs> when you were making the ink for the schoolroom. What did that literally mean to make the ink? Were you using a Chinese or Japanese ink stick on a? No, stone? we were. Um, don't forget, um, th this is a Victorian style teaching system. Um, um, little white China ink wells. You um, you had a a, a tin of powder. I had a white uh, enamel jug, um, pouring jug, a tray into which all I used to go around collect the dirty inkwells, uh, which were full of blotting paper and, and all kinds of stuff and um, hairs from the, from the little girl's pigtails. Um, and um, clean those out you mix water with it. It just was, there must have been some gum in it, but it, um, it was mostly, it tasted terrible. Um, Cause I used to, if 
if you lick your finger, it was very satisfying because you could get the blue right the way up to here if you were, and you had blue gloves for about uh, the rest of the day. But you then mix it up and to a point where it makes, it's not too pale, not too bl blue, but it was mostly blue. And then you pour it into its individual. It's it just a ready-made thing that, that, uh, that school suppliers sold. So supplies were very short. Um, pen points were reused and reused. We used to long to get new pen points, but they were always being turned back by the teachers saying, no, you can write more with that. We haven't got enough pen points. So it was just a regular system. And, uh, but it did make you, and this is the thing, when you learn to write in those days, you didn't just learn to make marks, which you would more or less can recognize. You had to learn to master a dip pen with flexible, quite pointed, sharp point, and you had to manage ink. The other thing we longed for was to be able to turn the page with all of the blots and smears on it from the previous work and come to a new page. This page is always going to be better and it's going to be better. But we were learning skills as well as learning. So you, I had to hold it in a way which meant it's easier to do calligraphy, let's face it. But if you learn to, if a ballpoint, a ballpoint will make a mark however you hold it, and the fiber even tip even easier. So there is no built in skill acquired um, you, uh, by using modern um, um, instant um, mark making pens. I must move from that, yes. And those nibs that you just talked about, you have both pointed and edged nibs and were they Mitchell's or what were they? They were any number of different makers actually, but Mitchell's were one of the makers, but the edge pens were not in the average child's uh, dreams. Um, the reason I got them uh, an edge pen uh, as, a, a little, as a gift from the headmaster, pardon me, the one that taught, um, was basically um, another accident, accidents that happened, because he wrongly accused me of stealing some money um, from his drawer, drawer in his office. Um, he later found it underneath the lining in the drawer. Um, and um, he, um, I was slated to be heavily punished um, and then I suddenly got ill and, and <laughs> I really was ill, but, um, and then he found the money and knowing my interest in lettering and fancy writing, he sent to my home while I was still in ill, um, uh, a, a packet with some pen points, uh, with Mitchell type square cut nibs and a, and a loan of a little book, which he must have had himself when he was a trainee teacher. But those pen points uh, were just his own personal ones. They weren't generally issued. We were just given regular pointed nibs. And we were supposed to write copper plate. Um, you know, we, we, we wrote push pull. Uh, we didn't, we, we sort of, um, we were, we were, we were the on the writing on the board and it was this very much this. I mean, I can't get pressure on this. Um, my hands in the way um so it's more more uh yeah it's sort of you know it was sort of this sort of style you know with a that kind of thing and we were, we were taught to to do these very much this sort of decorated thing and it would be you know I, um, you know and some of the letters we didn't quite understand um, um this isn't prime for this we would we would do things like this and before long, the this would become something like this. I mean, you know, we, we, we were floundering there, but it was, it was, I haven't got here a flexible point, but it was that, so you had to learn to do that. I mean, you know, certain generations in the States, particularly in, in, and in other parts of the world, that was how they were taught from copper plate examples. Um, next question. Yes, uh, just to uh, talk about materials again. Um, yeah. When were you first introduced to vellum, and did you use the gold leaf recipe by Cennini, or uh, how did you finally get a good gold recipe? But first of all, how did when did you get vellum first? So well, the vellum, uh, vellum, 
you see, I didn't know the difference between vellum or, and parchment, I, or sheepskin and calfskin. And I guess my teacher, the one that I told you, he, he had a full-time teaching job in the secondary school. And I was uh, in the secondary art department and I had moved into the senior where I did life drawing. I did all kinds of things, um, uh, textile design and book binding, as I said, and um, uh, some ceramics, uh, very little. I didn't, didn't like it. So, um, he sourced some parchment and that's what i was using when i was copying the, from the old manuscript pages that i saw in the libraries uh, and the towns nearby and it was cheap skin was very greasy it was i didn't know how you could treat it and he found for me something like a box with a powder on it which said pounce which basically this was what was supplied to the lawyers' offices and the law stationer, the people who used to write legal um, documents and so on. I mean, I mean, in the United States, you still, um, it, you still, well, I was familiar with the expression. I've had my sheepskin, meaning I've had my degree diploma presented to me, um, and a lot of that was for printing. A lot of the sheepskin was literally for letterpress. They just used it for letterpress for diplomas and any repeat stuff. But calfskin, which is um, more uh, forgiving and also meant for the finer writing, um, was a distinction I had no real idea of until I got to, uh, until I got to London, which um, was you know, as, as you saw some time after my, I did that final piece for my exams on vellum. I just think we sent away uh, now, and it's a long time ago, I, we sent away to the vellum makers in uh, near London um, called Band and Company. They've been going for 150 years then, I think. And you just ordered a sheet of it. And what you did with it would be just anybody now doesn't know what to do with it in those days when we got to I got to London I learned that you had to sandpaper it and get it to so that it, it built a nice velvety nap on on the surface so that then when you wrote and suddenly this very fine writing that you were trying to achieve happened because you were writing on a beautiful surface and the ink um, which we used, we were shown to use, was to be made individually by sticking, not in a bottle. A bottle of ink is meant to sell well, not meant to work well as ink. I mean, uh, it's a little bit uh, complicated that, but what I mean is a good ink for an ink manufacturer is one that sells a lot, not, uh, not one that calligraphers want particularly. So um, you could, we weren't, there was never a bottle, a magic bottle of ink you could dip into. Winter and Newton did do some sticking, they called it, in a bottle, but it was always fairly gloppy, um, which is not what you need. Um, I'm, mm, yeah, working with those materials, that came later. It was floundering with those materials, it was earlier. But that was a really good basis for being able to pick it up really quick when you've got the right stuff. Next. So, yeah, the next question is, um, people were fascinated by the fact that you were able to go to nearby libraries and see illuminated manuscripts, which isn't necessarily <laughs> the case here. Uh, and so they want to know when you were first able to get to the British Library, but also where were you located when you were able to go to nearby libraries and what okay. literally well, did you do when you were in the library? Were you able to right. copy while you were right there? Okay. Um, well, some things have uh, changed. Um, things are more casual uh, in one respect. And I remember talking to Sheila Waters about how when she was a young student, could go into the British Museum, um, British Library, and, um, and, and copy from original manuscripts. Um, but if, if you to go back to your original question, um, um, where I lived was in a located 
um, in between Liverpool, which is a major port on the west, and Manchester, which was a major industrial cotton um, manufacturing, it was called Cottonopolis in Victorian times. And uh, joining the two was a canal. And so the, the cotton, raw cotton would come in from the States or India and come straight in to Manchester and be processed and so on. And I lived in between and there was a similar kind of thing going on in a smaller way. But there was prosperity and there was, uh, um, as, as in the US, uh, that I know, and most other places, I'm sure, that there were those local levels of benefactors and uh, philanthropy, and they would establish free libraries for the workers. And so those free libraries would have in them educated people who were running them. And so when they have their collections um, of anything to do culturally with work, then every now and again, somebody who had bought, you know, you know one of the directors would had bought a few leaves from an old manuscripts being sold in Paris in you know in, at the turn of the century for very little money would give them to the library and they would that's how humble they were or the librarians could look in catalogues of of the of the of the um, antiquarian book dealers in London say uh, we've got leaves of this century or this this and this and they would just have a sample of it and that's all that was quite humble so I'd have a local town about eight miles away in one direction where from where I lived which is rich and grimy but its library had a little manuscript book which I was able to to look at and copy. They, they, nobody ever asked them for that. I went and just said, have you got any such thing? They said, well, I don't think so. We'll, we'll have a look and they would find. It wasn't, that was how casual it was. And, and there was a, a couple of other libraries, but on my doorstep, 12 miles away, was one of the finest collections of manuscripts in the world. Uh, and that was in Manchester itself, where a very wealthy industrialist had endowed a library especially intended for theological books because he was a religious man and um, it turned out that he ended up because two major collections came on the market i don't know what probably in the 19 i don't know tens or, or even earlier and i went there now they were much more careful they didn't want me anywhere near their manuscripts and and they had in glass cases and i was not as proper student, I was an art student. I mean, and that is obviously isn't a proper student in their academic way of looking at things. So um, I was so um, incensed by this, not letting me go there to look it through glass and copy at the side of it in a, on, a, on a desk. I went away and the one piece of work I showed where I said I begin to get the gilding right, which was quite bright, an M, I copied from a postcard, took it into the library, asked to see the director. This is of the one that didn't want me in there. And I put that on his desk and he went white. And he said, where, where did you get this from? And he just thought I'd cut it from a manuscript. And I said, well, I didn't get it anywhere. I made it. And he said, and to his credit, he said, okay, you can copy the manuscripts. So that was my ticket into that place. So when you ask that question, how did I do it? That was a rather long answer, but that's how it happened. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, so you, I had to, I, I don't know what drove me to do these things. I don't know really. I, 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 I mean, I, it wasn't in my cultural background. Where is it? Where are the sparks that prod you on? Uh, to do things like that. And that, I mean, that applies in anywhere in the world, I imagine. But somehow or other, it's there that it happens. And given the luck, given other people would call it providence, but, you know, I call it luck um, to, to do that. So you had to find out these things the hard way. But I have to say, in London, when I, when I arrived there, you could actually buy quill pens from a shop that made quill pens. Um, but they didn't principally make them for for writing. They often used them for for the ferrules of um, uh, sable brushes. But don't forget, 
there was a huge volume of memory, as it were, and also trades resting on the fact that, they, that London was this massive producer of documents. And, and a lot of them were, uh, were quite a substantial amount made in the law offices, people doing legal documents where each document is quite unique, the words in it are unique, so you can't, unless they're systematized, you can't print a lot, a lot of them. So there was still call for people filling in parts of documents, doing or whole documents. There was, they bought their quills from there, but these were fading, they were fading. And actually, um, calligraphy was going out of art schools. It was hemorrhaging. It couldn't justify itself. On the heels of the arts and crafts uh, movement, it was seen to be something that was part of the whole. It was actually romantic and, you know, there was an antiquarian aspect to all of that, um, to, to, to drive in that. They were trying to reach a golden period that existed behind them. Um, but um, so, the, so people like um, William Morris actually had to rediscover the art of making vellum for writing because a lot of the vellum manufacturers, as now, were using it for printing. Uh, or other things. So we've always been a minority sport. And when the art schools were reassessed um, in the 50s and early 60s, uh, calligraphy was not found to be justified. It was treated. Now, when Irene Wellington had 30 odd students, just you know, three or four people specializing in, in calligraphy, so consequently, we didn't get much of her. The other students were pretty much compulsorily having to do it as part of their graphic design course, equivalent, as it were, to life drawing, um, is to painting and drawing. Um, then doing calligraphy was supposed to be helping them uh, be better graphic designers until somebody said, well, it's a lot cheaper and more effective, probably, if you give them lots of sheets of colored paper and a pair of scissors. And then they can learn design by moving colors and shapes around. A perfectly valid way of thinking. But calligraphy did not, was not, the argument was lost. Um, and by the time I, and I was teaching in an art college a few miles away, uh, a place called Camberwell, which actually I think Johnson also taught at it one, uh, in his early days. And one of my students, was somebody called Charles Pierce, which is well known to people in the US and the UK, who had been literally told to find somewhere else to study. And my head of department at the graphics there wanted calligraphy in there, and he wanted it there because he wanted there to be always some few calligraphers. Michael Gollick was one of them, two, uh, Yeah, and Reese was another. And we sheltered, I, I taught that them and they, we shall sheltered under the umbrella of a much bigger department we were called book production. So this, this, you know, we started on an art historical note um, and I'm sort of ending on it really here, but I think we're well over time. Um, and um, unless you feel there's another question I should answer. I think there's one a question, Donald. Um, <coughs> We have, we can go over a little bit if you'd oh. like. Oh dear. <laughs> got uh, cramp, yeah. more... You'd think I'd get cramp in my tongue, wouldn't you, with all the talking I do, but never mind. Well, if you'd like, this could be the last question. It's a little bit more philosophical and might be, um, you know, less, less quickly answered. Um, yeah. One person wanted you to elaborate a little bit more on how inspiration is waiting for us. And this is kind of connected to um, another person's question uh, stating that because we have a wealth of digital examples nowadays, do you find that constraining for us modern calligraphers or more freeing, or should we have to struggle? And the third part of that question is um, sort of connected with that, how is inspiration waiting for us? How does one become unique and original and find their own work? So it's kind of a tripartite question, but I think they're pretty well connected. Well, and interestingly, uh, I had sort of prepared a few notes, rather too many notes um, for this 
beginning talk. Um, we'll catch up later with some things. Um, and those notes were actually addressed to that very question. Um, well, you said there are three, but the one is about the inspiration and the um, um, uh, I'm just pulling my thoughts together here now. Um, uh, I started by saying we create our own, we create our own world. And what, what we have to embrace is the huge resource that we are to ourselves as, as a sort of receiving, you know, a receivers. We're already, as I said, imprinted. Um, our DNA is imprinted with all kinds of responses that are automatic. We do them. Uh, some things we have to learn. We have to learn to walk. And we have to learn to do a lot of other things, but some things and nature has got millions of examples of how, you know, the, of how nature has pre pre wired us. And we've been wired with this enormous ability to pull on our multifarious uh, experiences in our lives, as well as those that have gone before us. And so it makes sense to me that, um, you know, we've got these five senses. Um, and it makes sense to me that we should spend more time developing an openness to that. And we come around to this in the final stages where I'm talking about work on the Bible for all those years, there are quite a lot of lessons there. Um, but one of them is you ask and you shall receive, as they say, um, if you can create that envelope, how you um, cultivate that, I, I personally, I think what Irene Wellington said in, in the first place was put your pen in the ink and that the problems become the kind of problems you want to find the answers to. Um, I'm wondering why I'm struggling here is because I've got two different ideas I know and I recorded um i put down um one of them is this look if you prepare yourself the ideas find you inspiration finds you it's already here it's here you have to pre prepare yourself to get it now that's two two two-sided one is the skills you know do what instinct makes you like doing what you've liked and that will change hopefully it will change you know you grow as you want different things you like different things but you cultivate your skills you know you way you handle things the ink the drawing you look at things you cultivate your memory that memory bank and you also then have to cultivate a state of mind in which doing opens up Funnily enough, if when you're cleaning your teeth or in my, you know, um, in the morning, that's when the ideas come. Often, cleaning teeth, doing mindless things, mindless, because your mind isn't involved. You're opening up. And problem of inspiration will never, it is, it, it's solvable. Um, just put your pen in the ink and feed your skills i had these these are notes i i just didn't look at the notes before i just said what i did but it says at the end of the questions interestingly enough i had written at the end of the questions feed your skills um gather memories feed your openness and put that at the service of your sixth sense put it at the service of those instincts watch it out for those sparks from your forgotten dreams. And don't forget to make sure you've got a good pair of glasses. <laughs> I think that's about all we should do tonight. We can pick up uh, next session if you like. I look forward to it. And I'm going to say goodbye now. Um, I, 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 I won't wait for goodbyes if you don't mind, other than my own. And um, I hope you um, to see you next time. Thank you very much, Donald. Bye. Totally fantastic.
people are wanting to know uh, where we can find the recordings. I believe they'll be put, Christy can explain this if I'm wrong, but I believe they'll be put on the SFC website and probably on the YouTube channel. So thank you. I only wish I'd have the, yes, I only wish I'd have the chance to edit them, but they're there for what they're worth. And you are here at the time. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you, Donald. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.